Hello and welcome to the Modern Adventurer podcast coming up. Go in between half and one and a half knots, depending on whether you're on a wave, and they were going at like 10 knots and they're just come plowing by. And then you've got the wake afterwards as well and I'm completely side on and it's pitch black and you're kind of blinded by this thing. And it's like, wow, when you're also like, my heart's beating so fast because... Um, am I going to die? If you haven't already, please feel free to subscribe to the show because we have some incredible guests coming up week after week. My next guest is a true adventurer. She broke the record for becoming the youngest person to row solo across the Atlantic of what could have taken her up to 100 days. But she finished in her 70 days crossing the finishing line after encountering sleep deprivation, hallucinations, and coming head to head with a boat that almost took her out in the middle of the Atlantic. But through all that, she had some incredible experiences. And today on the podcast, we talk about some of them. So I am delighted to introduce Jasmine Harrison to the podcast. Thanks for having me on here. No worries. Well, absolutely great to have you on. You've last year got back from completing this incredible trip rowing across the Atlantic and you became the youngest solo female to do so. How did it all start? Um, It all started three years ago, three and a half years ago now, um, when I decided to go to the Caribbean because I'd never been really like anywhere like that. I'd never seen a white sand beach. And I thought, let's go to the one that everybody has on their postcards. Um, So I went to the Caribbean um, got involved in doing some swimming teaching in an island called Grenada and then basically managed to get on a boat due to the, the hurricanes hit. This was in September 2017 and uh, sailed throughout quite a few of the islands, maybe 15 islands going all the way up north. And Antigua was one of the stops on the way. I was in Antigua for a few weeks um, and saw... There was all this commotion going on and somebody said, oh, do you want to hold a flare? And I was thinking, hold a flare for what? Okay, yeah, sure. And so these guys have just rode across the Atlantic. And I was like, oh, amazing. And then I met lots of the friends and family of different teams whilst I was there. And I basically just got really inspired and thought, I want to do this. Like, I don't know what it was, but standing up on the um, fort, looking over, going, I want to be that person on that tiny little boat. And don't know why I just did. I needed, I think I needed a bit of an escape, a bit of a change at that point. Um, and that just seemed like perfect escape. I mean, the situation wasn't that bad, but, um, yeah, I was just taken by it completely. So then came back home cause I'd run out of money cause the cabin is quite expensive, especially when you're on a boat. Um, and then worked, carried on traveling a little bit around, um, like Eastern Europe and then, thought no I'm definitely gonna enter so I entered and then it was a year and a half preparation planning getting sponsors training setting off and then 70 days later finished and we're about five months later now and I'm here doing a podcast with you amazing well I mean because you're not a rower your sort of backgrounds in swimming so this was the first time you were going to row wasn't it? Is that right? Uh, and the idea was to do it solo. So how was that sort of taken? Um, in terms of by like other people or the decision for me to do it? Well, I, I sort of imagine because I remember the, my my first big trip and when you, let's say, haven't ever done anything that big to suddenly go from nothing to the biggest, which I think sometimes the best way. I imagine there was quite a few naysayers around. Yeah. But also, I didn't really make it like a big deal. Um, I was just sort of, I didn't really tell anybody for six months after entering um, that I'd actually sort of entered it. I told my friends and said, oh, I'm just going to do this rowing thing. Um, but also like, they're just like, right, cool. You know how, I, like every weekend I'm away doing another swimming event or another competition or something um, or to another country. And then they're like, oh, okay, cool. And then it was only in the December. So I entered in like the May, June. And it was only in the December that I went to the start line of the like next, the last year's race and like went on a boat, went boat shopping 
And all I did was I took a photo, stood on um, a boat, and I set it as my profile picture on Facebook and I just went, in exactly a year, I'm going to row across the Atlantic. And then everybody just went, boom. And everybody was like, wow, oh my gosh. And then suddenly my friend that knows this reporter or that person that works for the local newspaper and everybody just went absolutely crazy over it. So, right, okay, well, I'm really glad I never said this earlier because I couldn't ask with the hassle for the past six months, to be honest. Um, so, that yeah, that's how it sort of came out. People weren't that negative, really, because by the time I'd sort of told people, you could tell I was sort of had my head screwed on with it and I could actually answer questions and say, look, that's my boat. This is what's happening. It's happening right now. Look, I can do it. And to be fair, there was, it, when it's such a big event like that, um, you're so focused on what you need to achieve rather than actually listening to other people. So the fact that I knew that nobody could help me with just their opinion, I needed to know a fact. I, need to, I needed to know which way around your rowboat. You know what I mean? And then they're like, unless you've rowed an ocean, I'm not going to listen to you. And so you don't end up sort of having that much negativity. And it was it was only when it came from a rower that I was there like, oh, you think I'm not going to make it? Okay, now that's quite a big thing for me, actually. But everybody else, I'm like, you don't know what you're on about. Don't give me your opinion. Um, so yeah, it was a bit different. I'm interested because, as I say, it's this incredible event for people listening that happens every year going from uh, Canary Islands to Antigua? Yeah, Ligamero, just next to Tenerife. Yeah. And how do you go boat shopping? <laughs> Did it sort of you go to the year, the uh, previous years before and you buy it off the, like that? You sort of go with all the start boats and go, I like that one. Can I buy that off you when you finish? To be fair, I don't really know what most people do. I had never seen one, never been on one, was just completely taken. So I went along the dock and especially all the solos because I was like, oh, the teams, they're not not the same level. <laughs> um, and uh, I went on the solos and I was just speaking to them saying, oh, hi, can I um, just look at your boat? Do you mind if I stand on it? Is it weird if I ask to be in your cabin? Is that strange? Not, not, not like that. But like, I just want to see what it's like. I just have no idea. And I just sort of was more taken by the different designs than what people had done. And it was actually just more sitting in one and feeling like, is this the right thing that I've done? Could I sit in one of these cabins for potentially like 100 days? So that's what I was doing. And then I was going along the different boats. And then there was one boat that I asked to sit on, literally just sit on the own position and just go, mm, could I sit here? Um, and it just took me. Don't know why, I just really liked that boat. There was something about it. Um, and I sort of asked how much it was going to be um, and like, what you do, how do you buy a boat? And to be honest, he was really, really useless. Didn't help me at all. But then... I don't blame him because he was about to go do a, do a row, but also he was useless afterwards. Um, and it was, I sort of needed time to decide. And it was in like the January that I went and somebody said to me, that's the boat that you want. Well, you best um, actually put a deposit down. I'm like, you need to put a deposit down. So I'm like, I've never bought anything like big in my life. I never bought a car or done anything like that. So I was thinking deposit. And I was like, I need to get hold of this guy in the middle of the ocean. So I'm like, um, messaged his like Facebook page and they replied saying, oh, we'll speak to him. I said, I need to give you a much deposit. How much deposit do you need? I don't know whether I've got it, but I need to buy this boat. Like panicking that this boat that I just really, really wanted was going to be gone by somebody else. Um, and that's how I did it. I have no idea. I think a lot of other people actually get boats made for them. They get them done brand new. But I was had not a single sponsor at that point. And it was just, I, know. I, know, I thought that because I loved this boat, everybody else would and so I was like I need to fight for my boat um I didn't nobody else wanted it <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good boat Argo is my boat and actually uh, I sell next week exactly a week today on Wednesday whatever day it is um Argo's gone gone 
Sold. Oh. Same way same way that you bought it though? Someone messaged you in the middle of the ocean? <laughs> Not quite. Um so uh, I've had a few people message me saying, Oh, is Argo for sale? Because now it's becoming a big popular thing that a lot of people want to go do. And there's, to be honest, there's not that many boats out there, not for how many people want to. Um, and so I've seen this post put on Facebook by this guy. And the only reason I noticed the post was because it was a picture of me. It it taken like one of, the, one of the ones that landed campaigns, the race body had taken of me and Argo out at sea and put it to this page saying, has anybody got a solo boat for sale? And I was like, what's rude? What's mate? How that boat is for sale? Excuse me, thank you. Um, and so I just messaged him, saying, "Hi, you know that photo? Yeah, that boat's for sale. If that's the photo that you picked out, why didn't you wonder whether that one was for sale?" And so I literally just messaged and was like, "Excuse me," and now it's going to him. Amazing, passing the buck down or passing it down. Mm -hmm. And so, and so. Of course, with all these sort of events, sponsorships, the hard part. Yeah. How, how did that sort of come about? Because you got your deposit down for the bait. You had the bait, but also I think unless you've got huge pockets, you need sponsors to sort of go about. And so how did you go about it? Um. I'd started actually trying to get sponsors the previous six months before even the very start. Um, and I was sort of going on company websites, Googling about them a little bit, and then just sort of messaging them, you know, sort of send an email. Look, this is what I'm going to do. It's completely naive. I had no idea. I was there like, well, why wouldn't Amazon want to send me money? You know, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, you, you see the big sponsors on every sport event. And I think, oh, this is going to be a big sport event. They'll sponsor me too. They've got loads of money. They don't want it. They probably get requests all the time. They don't care. And so I sort of changed dramatically on my approach of just sort of lying there on the grass in the middle of summer, sending a random text to Haribo saying, will you give me some money? Um, and then I decided that I would stick local um, find, because where I live, there's a lot of big companies anyway. So and our town, everybody knows everybody. So I thought, let me ask everybody that I know if they own a business. And I suddenly got really tuned into every single person that came into the pub. I'd look at their work shirt and I'd see what, because they always come for a pint after work. And I think, oh, who do you work for? Are you the owner? And it gave me ideas of businesses. And then he starts speaking to somebody. I said, do you know a friend that owns a business? Do you own a business? Sort of collecting knowledge of people and then say, oh, I'm looking for people to sponsor me. Who sponsors local things? So I basically created a massive list of smaller sponsors that I would approach um, to then much bigger ones, like on huge industrial estates um, that are multinational. So I basically sent a couple of messages and found out as much as I could. I figured, nah, we're just going to walk right in there. Just walk straight in. Don't even warn them. So they can't even sort of prepare a speech of to say no. And I go in and I said, hi, could I speak to so-and-so? Somebody that I found out through somebody. And then they say, your friend, whatever, told me when they were very drunk that you would sponsor me. So you're going to have to. Um, and... Uh, so I did that. I just find on the name of somebody walk in and say, this is what I'm doing. We sponsor. And most of the time they then said, yes. Well, I say most of the time, there's probably only about five occasions that I actually managed to do that. And especially when you've got one that is quite well respected, suddenly you're going to get loads. Um, and they sort of, well, I say loads, they chain on from each other because yeah, everybody, everybody likes to be sheep and they follow each other. What? They sponsored you. Well, I'm going to have to. They can't get their foot in something that I'm not, you know. And it, it was quite funny, the competitive sort of thing throughout all the local businessmen. Um, but then also COVID hit and all of these sponsors that had promised me that they would sponsor um, quite a lot then didn't. Um, and it was quite difficult or they then didn't until the October, the following October. So now I spent all the time training, having to buy things, having to spend all of this money that I didn't have until sponsors then gave me. And I didn't fully buy my boat 
um, until I think the day I started the row. I think that's when I did my final payment. I was sending him like payments as soon as I'd get a sponsor in, I'd then send off um, just because I was like, please, please, can I do that? Because otherwise I can't pay you. But I'd put my deposit down, so it's my vote. Um, and then also the payment for the race entry fee and stuff. But it, it was difficult to find sponsors. Just COVID was the biggest pain ever as well. And it, it's a, no, nobody wants to believe that this, well, at that point I was only 20, 20 year old girl that's only ever really spam and gone traveling like most people. Um, I was actually going to do something so big and cool. Some people are like, oh, I'm straight on it. I believe you right away. And other people that are like, nah, you're all right. Did you know that you were going to be the youngest solo female to do it? Yeah, I did. Because that's a sort of good uh, USP for sponsors. And I imagine, and actually your approach of going local is by far and away for people listening who are going down this route is the best way to go is, you know, friends of friends and people in the local area. I, I think it was Bear Grylls who decided when he knew he was climbing Everest to rather than go to the big ones, he went to his local window repair, which was called Everest or something, um, and approached them. And they said yes, because it had Everest and it was Bear Grylls. So he was like, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was, I, I think my USP was one that didn't necessarily always work to my favour, though. I'm going to be the youngest girl that's ever done it by yourself and people go I wonder why somebody's not that young then and I think that's what kind of went through their heads I thought it's great I've got USB I can say I'm gonna get a world record but in their minds it was a bit more doubt I was thinking right okay if I could have if I'd already done it right and I suddenly next year go I'm gonna be the fastest that's a USP you know because they I've got something to back me up and suddenly everybody's gonna or if I'd already climbed Everest and then I said I'm gonna be the youngest person that's gonna row this then it's like wow yes we're all backing you not are you though are you really um and I also I didn't want to over promise anything because I couldn't say it's definitely gonna be on BBC News I can't if I could have said I'm gonna have what like however many hours of live airtime all over national TV, um, maybe they'd have said, "Oh yeah, right, we'll give you a lot of money then," because that's our logo. Um, but I couldn't promise. Couldn't. <laughs> well, I suppose that's um, that's always a difficult thing with sponsorship. And so you were starting. What was the sort of date that you start? Um, 12th of December. 12th of December. You've got the boat. You've just paid your last payment. You're getting ready to row out. Family all there to wave you off? Nope, because of COVID. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the sort of feeling like sort of setting off, knowing that you've got another two, three months ahead of you by yourself? Um, it was quite relieved that actually I made it here. I'm okay. I've got to this point. But then it was almost it was incredibly scary. And I was just more nervous of actually getting away from the start line. Like I always think you've never quite made it yet. Like yes, you're at the start line, but I need to get out of the lock gates. Not the lock gates, sorry, that was the train out of the harbour wall. I need to not hit the ferry. I need to go in the channel to get out I then need to clear the island and then I have a waypoint that I need to pass and then I've got this and so it was all very staged I never sort of stopped worrying because I was always nervous about then the following sort of challenge um but also it didn't help that I was like having a bit of a I was tripping a little bit on like seasickness patches um and you know you think you're fine and, and you because I'd never experienced anything doing such a big challenge that I would be so nervous. I didn't know how my body was going to react. And I thought, well, this must just be normal. Maybe this is just a side effect of um, doing something so big and scary. And it, it wasn't, it was because I had seasickness patches and I was then like emotional, but also completely not. I was like sort of cold 
but also like what's going on and everything happened so quickly. It was, um, it's a feeling that I, I want to go back to the start line this year. And I think that will clear up a lot of things for me, seeing it from the outsider's perspective again. And that I think will put me back in that place. Um, so that's going to be a bit of a weird one, but yeah, it was, it's, it, it was just indescribable. I think having all of them factors in one. Yeah, I think, um, God, do you, do you usually get seasick? No, mm. I had been told to take the patches anyway, um, because then it's precautionary. Never do that. Don't do what people tell you to do because that messed up everything. <laughs> Good. And so, <clears throat> so you're sort of out in the ocean. How does it sort of feel sort of, because you're you're on your own, so you've got to sleep. Because I know in pairs or in fours, they sort of do two hours on, two hours off, and that's where they sort of sleep and they're rowing the whole time. But being on your own, you have to sort of sort of stop, go to sleep for a bit. I mean, you must how what was the sort of routine of being in the boat? So the first few weeks was a bit of a different routine because well, the first the first couple of weeks I was doing a couple of hours on, a couple of hours off, um, sort of like what is recommended. And then I got hit with some really bad weather and I couldn't stop rowing. I had to row to try and fight it quite a lot. Then I was on power anchor, which was just a big, it's like a sea anchor that stops you or tr tries to stop you from moving when the wind is blowing in the wrong direction. Um, and I then ended up, sort of being able to sleep for days because I couldn't row. And then you try and pick it, and then you try rowing again. And I'm rowing for like 20 hours a day, just straight. Um, but then it then flows more again to later on. I figured out that I was faster rowing at night time. So I'd sleep a little bit more during the day and row for longer at night. And then the weather, the, the ocean would change again, or I would change and it would be faster to do it the other way around. So I'd end up sleeping at night rowing a lot during the day and it was um I never really got into a, a proper routine but I would the majority of it I'd sleep um between three and eight like a.m oh wow good and I suppose being out in the ocean you know there is nothing it's just you're surrounded by water I you must have seen some incredible wildlife throughout Mm. Um, the wildlife was amazing. So I swam with dolphins. Um, just to say that you've swam with dolphins before is a really cool thing to be able to say. But it's not like you had to wear a life jacket and you were stood in a warm pool in Florida and you have a photo of it. You know what I mean? It, that's not swimming with dolphins. That's sort of like standing there petting one. I was in the middle of the sea and they're all around you and you can hear them all, you're under the water and you can hear them all squeaking and bubbling and diving around each other. And it was something else. It was just completely next level. Incredible beauty to be able to see something so clearly through such clear water. Um, and them looking at you going, who are you? What are you? And I'm going, what are you? Like, it's just absolutely incredible. And I had lots of fish as well. So I spent, I think I wasted quite a long time of rowing, um, watching wildlife. I didn't care. I dropped my oars and just watched them. I was meant to be rowing and I spent three hours filming some fish um, because they were really pretty, which they are. And uh, it was just, it was really, really cool. I had whales. Um, I had some little pilot fish, some stripy fish under the bottom of my boat. Like every single day they were there. I might have tuna, I had Dorado, um, I had a marlin as well. I had a big striped marlin to say hi. Um, I had flying fish, lots of flying fish. I even had a squid land on my boat. Um, and I also had a crab, which is a really weird one. Literally like 40 days in, um, I had a tiny little albino crab that was um, just said hi. I was like, pretty sure you shouldn't be here. And it really questions your uh, my knowledge as well. I was thinking, 
crabs. They should be at the seaside. They need rocks and sand. They don't need thousands. And I felt really bad. Like this guy, he was clinging onto the bottom of the boat because he was there when I was cleaning it. And I got him. I took him off the bottom of my boat. He wasn't there before because I've cleaned the bottom of it and it was already 40 days in. Can't hang there for 40 days when I've already cleaned him. Um, and I sort of brought him on deck and I was there like, I don't know what to do with you now because I'm thinking if I throw you overboard, you're then going to take hours before you hit the bottom of the sea. Like, I don't, it's like, what do I do? And so I did, I was like, well, I can't leave you on the boat because, you know, there's nothing for you to eat. You're just going to have to go back in the sea, mate. Sorry, but I I just don't know. I wish I knew stuff and I should maybe Google it, but I also don't want to find out that I did the wrong thing. So when you were swimming with dolphins, did you sort of just strap yourself on because you can't really not strap yourself on to these boats because within a second they could be 100 meters away from you and so did you just sort of float there and just swim around while they sort of circled you or yeah so i always when you're rowing you have to have a harness on around your waist and you're always attached to the boat um and then when i swam i just put myself on an extended lead um of just a rope that I had attached and um jump in go swim with them and yeah they were, sometimes there was loads of different like pods that were sort of ones right below you ones over there ones behind you ones in front of you and it was really cool and you just sort of I'd swim towards them so swim away from Argo swim towards them and uh I just was so mem- mesmerized by it I'd be there and I think where's Argo gone? I think, oh, I'm attached, right? But I have no idea whether my boat's over to my left, to my right, in front or behind me, not a clue, because I'm so fixated on these dolphins that I'm just sort of watching a swim underneath me. Um, and there's no, there was no tension on the stroke, and I had, I had one panic, I just went, oh, am I still attached? Can you imagine if not? And I was like, immediately come on, I was like, oh, right, okay, we're fine, we're fine. But yeah, you definitely got to stay attached. So why, why you were there? Because I know that you... What was really interesting about your trip was that you're in this huge expanse of ocean and the chances are so slim of you being hit by something. But that's what actually almost happened to you. Yeah. Um, You think you've got like vast ocean, you're never even really going to see anything. And then in the middle of the night, um, I had a big like 800 foot ship was going on the exact same course as me, right behind me, and they took me out. Um, I had to try and radio them and steer up the way and row and, yeah, try and avoid it, which it did just because I managed to get them on the radio, but um, it was quite a close call. I don't think any rowing boat has been that close to a boat in the middle of the sea. Yeah, because you are, how big's your boat in comparison? It must be... 10, 12, 20 foot? Yeah, uh, 21 foot is my boat. Um, and the, this tanker, well, it was, a, it was a drilling ship and it was 800 plus feet long, 830, I think. Um, so you're an ant compared to it. Yeah, <laughs> literally absolutely tiny. And the fact that this thing towers, like they on boat measurements that you see, you it's always like the width and... The lead. There's never really how actually tall a boat is, and this boat honestly was so so tall. Like it was towering over the top of me. I'm like, oh, like I was so close that if it toppled over, it would flatten me. Like <laughs> it was really really scary, and it was just the light that it created. It was just it owned the ocean. Like and yeah, you feel so insignificant how were you sort of alerted to it so i have a system called ais which um alert incoming ship is the easy way to say what it is and it says an alarm when there is a boat that's fairly close to you um however this one didn't alert me until it was like quite late on it told me when we had like six minutes till impact but that's in the middle of the night and this was actual impact not they're a mile away and they're never going to hit you 
um because you know it could be a mile to my side it's fine um and i kind of woke up thinking oh it's just another one that's just way off it's like four miles away and it's not, and it's going the opposite direction stuff like that um and i sort of was oh, I'm so tired right turn off the alarm wake up and go Ah, she's quite close to me, right? Okay, maybe she'll do something about that. Um, what do I do? Uh, radio? What's the boat called? Should I? Do I dare look outside and see this thing coming towards me? Um, and it's, I would have thought a lot clearer or a lot faster, but I was so tired. I'd, I'd just been asleep for like an hour or something because it was about four o'clock in the morning. And I was just there like, ugh, why? Um, and also thinking, you think, oh, it's fine, they'll be able to see me. They've got a system on board and it tells them. I've got lights on, they'll see my lights. No, did not happen at all. Um, but I managed to get hold of them and they moved very last minute when we had 0.2 miles till impact, which is literally a couple of hundred metres. Um, and they turned and missed me. Just so they turned north, so they turned to um, starboard, and I had turned to port and headed south. And um, yeah, it was quite closer. <laughs> I mean, you're probably going at what zero point five of a mile an hour or knots. Yeah, pretty much. I was going between half and one and a half knots, depending on whether you're on a wave. Um, and they were going at like ten knots. Um, and they're just come plowing by and then you've got the wake afterwards as well and I'm completely side on and it's pitch black and you're kind of blinded by this thing and it's like wow when you're also like my heart's beating so fast because um, am I going to die do you do a do you sort of have that but when you don't know whether something's going to happen or you like you don't want to pretend like you are what if I'm just being daft and you know it was just a bit of a weird one I just don't know how to take the situation um because also it's quite prolonged, like there was time. And so they're like, I've got time to think, but I need to think correctly. This is really important. Um, and it, it's a bit of a strange one. Yeah. What would you say that was the uh, biggest near miss? Because uh, I know, I remember listening to Ben Fogel and James Cracknell's uh, little, tri- little trip. It's not really that little. Uh, rowing across the Atlantic and, you know, you capsize and, all sorts was was that the worst or did you have other other moments so i did have a capsize as well but i kind of had two one was um i was on deck and i just went for an accidental swim that didn't really bother me a little bit i was a little bit sort of like shaky like it was just a bit of an adrenaline but then the second one was yeah by that point you're so, you're so in tune with the boat you can feel what's okay what's not okay so this first like capsize, I was like, it's all right, to be fair, it's fine. Um, but then the second one, when I was in my cabin and I was asleep, again, it was like four o'clock in the morning. Um, and I went the whole way around and it I got bounced off the ceiling, bounced off the side, and it really hurt. Like, and that was the one that I thought we argue maybe wouldn't be okay. I thought, have I lost anything that was on deck? Have I lost my life raft? Have I lost my oars? And I really hurt my elbow. I'm pretty sure it like broke because I whacked it so hard on some safety glass on a battery monitor screen. And I then swelled up that I couldn't bend it um, to be able to row. But I was two, I was two days out. So it wasn't too bad. But it was, I think that would have been the worst if I was actually out at sea and I still had a long time to go um but because I was so close to shore I didn't mind well obviously I did it really hurt and I was like oh my poor boat we nearly made it um but yeah that was sort of I think if that had happened in the middle of the sea that would have been a lot worse I suppose on those last two days you were sort of running on adrenaline you you knew that you were close so you sort of knew your time at sea was coming to an end and you just had two days to sort of push through the pain barrier and get to the end. Yeah, pretty much. 
Um, and that's what happened. And to be fair, the reason I capsized is because the swell was so big that I didn't actually really need to row for the next two days anyway. I had to be awake to make sure that I was steering in the right direction, but it was such bad weather. I only really needed to row for the last day to make sure that I could get in, but I had like 24 hours recovery time after the capsize anyway. Um, so it was okay. And at that point, I didn't, I knew I was going to arrive in on Saturday. I didn't care what time or anything like that. I was just, you know what, when I make it, I'll make it. I just wanted to come in on a weekend and that's, and I still was, even if I didn't row. So it was fine. And I needed that last, that like day to sit there and take everything really in. You know, I don't need to be rowing. I can just, I'm on my boat. I'm in the ocean. Antigua's just over there. Let me enjoy and savour and watch this sunset properly. Let me not play any music and let me just absorb this world. Um, which, yeah, whilst obviously sat there going, oh, my arm, I forgot that that really hurt. Um, but it was, it was something magical about the last few days. Yeah. You sort of had time to reflect. Yeah. Before I then got hit massively with media and cameras and people there's suddenly a lot of people <laughs> and after what 70 days of seeing no one you suddenly were surrounded by crowds and all sorts yeah what, what was what was the feeling like when you came into the bay and you could see i well actually family probably weren't there because of covid as well so my mum got there um because you can say I needed somebody. I was there with no money. Um, I had no phone that was working either and no clothes. So I needed to have somebody to be there, basically. And I was elite athlete, so you could get away with having one person. Uh, okay. And so, yeah, what was the feeling like when you rode in? Um, Again, it was a little bit like the start. It was the most amazing wow sort of thing but there was so much else to worry about so I was I was panicking again I've not seen land in such a long time and suddenly you see land and that's the one thing that I'm really scared of on a boat because I always feel that you're so smart and you've had the whole ocean suddenly there's land there and five meters away is way too close and actually you've got to be five meters to be able to get in through the harbour. And there was so many, with the boats around, so much noise and so many people telling me instructions, especially somebody that I didn't know. I was there like, I don't want to listen to you. Why am I listening to you? I was like, where's, where's people that I know and I trust? And, and then it's right. Okay. What, have I finished yet? Have I finished? One person's telling me that I finished. And then right, but that person said to me that, I've not finished until I hear the cannon go off. And then it was, oh, well done, Jasmine, you've made it. And I was like, right. And it says, I'll do another two strokes. Do another two strokes. And then I'm in, what's going on? I don't know. Um, and then I held the flares. I was like, yay, celebrate. But they burnt my hand really badly. So I was in so much pain. And I was just like, oh, no. And then I'm still, my biggest concern is Argo. And I'm like, I can see he's drifting towards rocks. Again, I've got to get back on the oars. I've, this is, I can't be, it, it felt like I hadn't, until I was on land, I hadn't made it. Argo wasn't safe. And you're so reliant, you've been reliant on just yourself for so long that as soon as there's help there, I don't know how to accept it. And it was just a bit of a strange one. Um, and so the finish was absolutely magical, but also the most stressed I've ever been <laughs> um, because it's quite an important thing and like I remember I lit the flare and I don't know I'd never lit a flare ever not like that in a way and I pulled the flare top off and I just launched it because for some reason I thought that was going to be hot it wasn't so I just took this top out to see and I went I was holding it and I went my entire I was raising money for a clean up the oceans charity <laughs> I've just been witnessed on camera throwing something out and then this then this flare burned my hand and I could feel it burn I thought I've got to throw it I've got to throw it and I thought you can't be seen to throw the entire flare as well into the sea so I could hold on Jasmine just hold on and it literally melted my hand away 
And I was just there like, it was just stressful. It was really stressful. I can't say it was the most enjoyable thing, but also it was because you had made it. And, you know, I was so thirsty. You get to land and then you're like wobbly. And you're like, and then you put a mask on you. And then I'm like, right, great. Can I have my food, please? Um, yeah, it was, it was, it depends on the day when I look at it and think about it, whether it was the most wonderful thing ever or actually the worst thing ever. Um, because I think that was also like the last day I probably rode my boat and it was, it is emotional and yeah, it's just a weird one. I think it had every single feeling you could possibly ever have in one. Good. And what do you think the sort of lesson that you sort of took from those 70 days about yourself? Cause you, as you, as we said earlier, I mean, you want a rower before you had this goal and you went out and achieved it and like unbelievable but like probably before you probably learned so much about yourself yeah um i think i don't know i spent a lot of the time clearing out my brain so i had a much yeah, clearer vision of life and what I wanted. Um, and that was sort of the biggest thing that I learned was actually I needed to have no distractions. You need to have a focus. And so, yeah, I had a focus of the finish line, but I needed to focus every single day. I needed to know that today I was going to do this, even if it's the smallest thing, even if I was going to eat something, that's a big thing. If I was going to clean the boat, if I, if the biggest achievement of the day was to sleep, I knew that to not feel like I wasn't achieving anything, I needed to have the smallest little goal um, and take everything step by step. And I think for me, that was like sort of what I learned about myself is that as long as you're, you've got to do something every day, like it would really annoy me if I didn't make miles. I was there like, but it's fine because you're still achieving it. And I was thinking, no, no, no. It doesn't matter if we don't row today, as long as we've done this. And I find that in everyday life now. As long as I've done something that is going to help towards the end goal of having a good life. Um, if you've done nothing all day, you're there like, right, I don't feel accomplished. I need to do something. Um, and I found that that's better for my sort of mental state as well, to know that but not make excuses for yourself. Don't think, oh, I needed to do nothing today again. You know, it's actually learning what your body needs um, is what I don't, because I've never been so in tune with myself. I never paid any attention to sort of like when I needed to go to the loo, you know what I mean? And suddenly I paid attention to that, I would say. Um, I don't, it just happened. And I ended up being, yeah, I know, I understand myself and my mentality quite a lot more. I think when you, as you say, when you're doing these trips and you have so much time to think because every day is very sort of simple when you break it down. It's, you know, get up, eat, row, sleep, eat, row, repeat. Um, it's almost like a T-shirt. And, and you have so much time to sort of think in that sort, it's like almost like a sort of form of meditation, which you can sort of do over 70 days. And I think you learn so much about yourself, your character, just how strong you are mentally. Whereas before, it's quite difficult to sort of figure that out sometimes. Mm. Yeah, it was strange that I needed such a big thing to make me understand myself. Like, I think other people are quite lucky that they sort of know things, like they, they know why they think a certain way or why they do certain things or what they really want um, just in life. But I'm quite a whatever, I don't really care. Um, and then it sort of changed on the ocean and I've become, yeah, a lot more self-aware. Yeah. God, I mean, it's an absolutely incredible story and just an incredible achievement as well. Um, any, anyone who rows across the Atlantic is just, a, especially doing it solo as well. It's just a phenomenal achievement. Uh, yeah, it'll, I feel like it'll feel like that maybe one day. 
why how how does it feel to you um i don't know it just it's what i wanted to do and so i did it you know it's um yeah i feel like for me it was just sort of what that's my achievement that's what i managed to do um and i knew that that's what i wanted to and i knew i'd make it so saying like I think it's quite personal, like the word for like you said, phenomenal. I'm thinking it's maybe not as for me, but for maybe somebody else, like you said, you ran like length of Africa. Kenya. <laughs> Kenya? Kenya? Well, <laughs> same thing. Um, like that, that is phenomenal. Like that is, that's like amazing. And like, I would probably be more proud of doing that than well, the, my well, own thing well then i'm sort of quite similar on yours it was something i wanted to do and in my mind i don't see it probably because you've sort of done it as a big deal because it's as you say you sort of it's something i wanted to do it's something that every day i got up and just ran and probably like you every day you got up and row and at the end it's an it's a great sort of feeling of achievement but it's something you don't think too much about yeah it, it is a strange one i'm just like it's just a story for me yeah um i don't necessarily always see it as an achievement i just see it as something to talk about as a story like something interesting um well, well that's a great story <laughs> thanks <laughs> good um good well i mean it's been absolutely incredible listening to this story of yours and thank you so much for coming on and sharing it there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week okay um which is the first being what's the one gadget that you always take with you on your adventures gadget doesn't um, have to be rowing it would be a camera i like to take a camera but then again, half the time I've never had a photo of cool things. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm not really a gadget person because I, I travel quite lightly. But it would have to be a camera, I th or I th phone, probably be a something to just take a picture on. There, there is something to be said. Like when you have these incredible moments of just I don't know being in the moment and sort of appreciating it which is usually what happens you sort of capture the sort of minor details but then suddenly when something incredible comes before you you sort of just stop and take it all in and don't capture that incredible moment but it's it's with you all the time yeah it's that uh, i find that just having like a photo it won't tell you anything really like somebody could look at it and go oh that's nice i'm like no it's so much more than that. It puts me back in a moment to relive something. Um, you know, it's the, yeah, I don't, I don't think I even, depending on the event, the gadget I would probably need would be GPS because I get lost quite a lot. That's the most necessity one for me. But um, yeah, be a camera is the most desired, like, desirable one. Yeah. Uh, what about your favourite adventure or travel book? Um... Adventure or travel book and map. <laughs> no, um, I really. Well, this is going to be like, I really like Ross Edgley. Um, so his first book, Art of Resilience, was quite, well, really, really good. Not quite. Um, and the fact that it was swimming as well, like, I to me, that just sort of screamed out like it's cool but i'm also like i don't understand how we can do it so it makes me think and like, how do you physically do it? even make everything sound so easy and it's one that i think should have much more like to and they're like but you you can't just say that you then just went into the gym and put on this much muscle in kilos like how, how can you how can you do that so i just find it fascinating something that i can read over and over again um and it's got everything in it. It's got science, mentality, um, adventure, and swimming. Perfect combo. <laughs> um, why are adventures important to you? Um, because it gives people life. 
like it gives me life um and it's it's stories i like to be able to talk to people and have something the smallest thing that reminds you of a time or something funny that happened um and everything can it makes things relatable like you have an adventure and suddenly you can be talking to anybody and you find something that you know you can your adventure has taught you about either listening to that conversation or being able to join into it and it's yeah and I think it's really important um just to get outside to build up confidence and it's also fun I like having fun I like things that are cool like adventures are cool you can't have a cool adventure yeah no very true um what about your favorite quote or motivational quote um so there was one that was from the first guy that rode argo my boat um this is his quote and it is be stronger than your excuse but i sort of changed that when i was rowing a little bit i was thinking be stronger than my excuse but I don't have an excuse. How can I be stronger than my excuse when I don't have one? And it, it sort of, I remember thinking about it quite a lot. I thought, right, don't give yourself an excuse. And then if you happen to get one, be stronger than it. And it sort of broke it into two parts. And so it's, I don't really know whether it's a, a quote, don't give yourself an excuse. And then if you do, because, you know, we've all got to have a fall now and then, be stronger than it. You know, and then I'm like, if you can't be stronger than it, oh, while well, you're having fun. Um, no, not quite that, but yeah, be stronger than your excuse is the official one and you can adapt it to whatever you feel like. Ah, uh, very nice. Um, people listening. Oh, are, oh, sorry, that was done by Mark Slaps. I'm Mark sure Slaps. <laughs> yeah. You, you could slightly change it and have it by yourself almost. Yeah. Don't give yourself the excuse, Charles and Harrison. But if you do, become Mark. <laughs> uh, people listening are always keen to travel and go on these grand adventures. What's the one thing you would recommend for people wanting to get started? Um, going on, to be honest, I wouldn't recommend um, anything because it make you've got to make it yours. It's got to be your adventure. So... For me, whenever I've done any traveling or gone to like a random country, I've been like, I pack lightly and I've just gone to the cheapest place. Like, and I've always been determined that I want to look for something cool. Like, I don't care as long as it's cool, but that's because that's what I'm into. Like your adventure is it's very personal. I think it's a really personal thing. Um, and so it would actually be don't listen to anybody and their advice because the advice that I got given was to wear sea sickness patches <laughs> and look what happened. And it ended up making me blind and going in circles and I lost three days worth of rowing. Um, so, oh yeah, don't forget hallucinating. I ended up seeing people that weren't there. So I think biggest advice is follow your path rather than listening to others because I'll, I'll have done something like that maybe another person wants to, but it's not quite the same. You know, it's, it's never the same if you're exactly trying to copy something. I think people are always trying to go for, you know, something unique. And in the world of sort of exploration, it's very difficult to find something that's unique, I don't know, to you. And so by creating your own sort of adventure, whether it's you rowing across the Atlantic, you know, you can create it and you have your own experience from it. Your experience is completely unique to you. No one else is going to have that experience. And so by doing it, you, I don't know, is this making sense? I'm not sure. You create your your own sort of story to tell. Yeah, I was thinking on what you've just said is, is don't force an adventure either. Like it should be, for me anyway, I, it took me so long to decide to definitely do it. I've got to if it's going to be a big thing and something that's going to really mean a lot and make a big impact on your life, don't take it lightly. Um, it's got to be sort of, you've got to know your own mind. So don't do it because somebody else told you to, or because somebody else did that. It's what do you really, really want? 
and that's what you've got to go for it. But also, you can turn anything into an adventure. Like, you just can. If you want to turn going to the shops into an adventure, do it, you know? Um, you can. How would you recommend doing that? <laughs> Have fun. Do you know, I, my favourite <laughs> I'm not I'm not a weirdo. I just sit in other people's trolleys. <laughs> um, and see what they do. And sometimes I'm like, oh, oh then I'm push you along and you just like, oh, cool, well, uh, that I'll please. And you know, it's just fun and you meet people and um and that ends up being an adventure and you don't know what's gonna happen. Like they might be like, Oh, nice to meet you and you've got a friend. Or or dress up. I this was the one during like lockdown was to dress up really smart to go to like to go to like Tesco's or whatnot, dress up in black tie and just to go do your shopping. <laughs> it's your, it's your one, one day out for the week or something. And that, that's an adventure. You can, yeah, you can do what you want. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a funny, it's a funny one. It's a funny world. <laughs> Finally, what are you doing now and how can people follow you in the future? So at the moment, Um, I am at the start of putting together a new adventure challenge thing for next year. Um, It's sort of in the very early stages of planning, um, so much so that when I explained earlier about the, I never never told anybody for the first six months because otherwise it just went crazy. Um, I'm not ready for that yet. I can't answer enough questions. So I'm planning on doing something next June um over the whole of summer and the best way to follow is social media my name is jasmine r harrison instagram um it's really mad at the moment on twitter and facebook but that was my team name for the rowing but i I think i need to change it so then i am me rather than my team name for a row so yeah you'll find me on jasmine on yeah (laughs) (laughs) so what is this big thing next summer Stop secret. Uh, no, it is uh, something okay. swimming related, something swimming related because I figured if I can um have never rowed before and then row three thousand miles and get a world record and suddenly be on a cool podcast like this, then what what could I do with um something I've actually done my entire life and I know that I'm fairly decent at? You know, where could that take me? So that's that's the plan. But it is um yeah, that's paperwork and admin i'm not very good at it i've not been a, i've not been like at home to be able to actually like laptop okay right let's do some work for a long time do you find yourself scouting google maps quite a lot yeah <laughs> i love it I've, I've got a special um notes folder which is just full of places that i need to go and tick off the list and i get really sort of you get a day and you think oh let's go tick off another thing off the list and you're like no okay you need to focus and you need to think about them your plans what do you want to do you know but i'm always i I was describing this like people say how would you come across these places and all of that and i'm like i'm like i have like an internal like human version of cookies that when you hear something it just sticks in your head and you pick up everything that is something outdoorsy or like adventurous or an edgy sort of place to go and i'm like it's suddenly come in and i don't know can't just go i couldn't tell you like if I tuned into something like, oh, let's tune into running. You know, suddenly I'll pick up all of these running routes into my head, but I don't. It's all do something different, and it swarms me. You know, I'm just walking around all the like, you know, your phone listens to you. It's like me listening to other things. You just pick up stuff. Everyone's convinced the pain is listening. <laughs> yeah, oh, it is definitely it. You have a little chat about fishing with your father or something. And then suddenly it's like, hey, do you want to go fly fishing next week? Honestly. So it's, it's daft to say the other day. Um, so my my, uh, my friend's dog had um, an accident and is now on like, it's got stabilizers at the back. Um, and with the, it's, she said, oh, we're going to have to find a new hydrotherapy place for him because it's shutting down. And genuinely the next day I had a, hydrotherapy um advert for a place to take your dogs to and i was just there like that was de- and it's the, i've only seen that advert once and that was literally the next day not seen it again since and, I, and i've never seen it before oh, right well that's clearly been listening to us <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Well, um, on a different note. <laughs> Don't worry. Jasmine, I can't thank you enough for coming on. It has been absolutely incredible listening to your story and can't wait to see what this big adventure next year is with the swimming. Yeah, well, we'll see. Um, <laughs> it, should, it should work. It should go ahead. It'll be fine. Yeah. Just need to get my, get my horse in gear a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's just been an incredible story and thank you so much for coming on and sharing it. No, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, having me, and also chasing me up about it because <laughs> I'm being quite useless at um, just even looking at my phone, to be honest. Well, that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you got something out of it. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video.